sermon title this morning is He Loved Them to the End. He Loved Them to the End. We're in part three. So we've been working through this text in John chapter 13, verses 1 through 17. And we're coming to the end of this section of Scripture this morning. Uh, it is just a glorious text. Uh, it's a beautiful text, a wonderful text. Uh, you see the Lord's instruction here uh, in the form of a, a painting, if you will, a mural, a living parable. As the Lord gives us an object lesson in the washing the disciples' feet from John chapter 13, verses 1 through 17. As we've worked through John chapter 13, verses 1 through 17, we have sought to understand first the heart and mind of the Lord as he's come to this hour with his disciples. We've considered the great love with which he has loved us and how that love impelled him, both in the example that he gives to the disciples of washing their feet but also then in the far greater act of humility, the far greater act of love that he displays at the cross in dying for his own. So Jesus Christ now and his disciples, they're gathered together in an upper room in Jerusalem and it's Passover and they're preparing to eat the Passover meal together. It's the eve of his suffering, the eve of his betrayal, his arrest, his trial, his scourging, his crucifixion, and his death. Many have called this section of Scripture in John chapter 13, verses 1 through 17 and beyond, they've called it a farewell discourse, the Lord's farewell discourse. These are the Lord's parting words to his disciples, the Lord's parting instruction to them before he departs from this world to the Father. So now, as the Lord and his disciples enter this room in Jerusalem, they walk into the room, and they've reclined around the table now for dinner. And there, off to the side in the room, is the basin, the pitchers of water, and the towel, a long linen towel. Conspicuously absent from the room was the lowly bondservant appointed to the menial task of washing the feet of the guests before supper. As we consider this scene together, again, it's difficult not to think of and remember the woman in Luke chapter 7. Having come to the end of herself, the woman in Luke chapter 7, convicted and wrecked over her sin, knelt at the Lord's feet weeping, washing his feet with her tears and wiping them with the hair of her head. Here, in the upper room on the eve of his death, the disciples offer no such act of devotion or worship to the Lord Jesus Christ. We know from context in Luke 22, they've been embroiled in an argument together over who was the greatest among them. In the thoughts of the disciples, no, no doubt influenced by the world, the notion of greatness certainly didn't include stooping to wash someone's feet. Under the circumstances, we could imagine them maybe a little indignant that no one was there to wash their feet. They were thinking only of themselves and not thinking to serve one another or even to serve the Lord himself in this. But now, before we judge the disciples too harshly for this, in thinking about them, we have to put ourselves in their shoes. We have to consider, don't we, how often, how frequently we are just like they are. Cut from the same cloth, guilty of the very same thing. Thinking primarily of ourselves, how often do we fail to love the Lord or to love one another as we should? How often, how often are we selfish rather than selfless? How often do we indulge ourselves rather than denying ourselves? All the time, right? All the time. So before we judge the disciples too harshly for their omission in that room that evening, we have to consider that we often, frequently, are just as they are. So as you consider these things, you begin to feel the point of the parable, right? The point of the living parable that the Lord is acting out here in John chapter 13. And the lesson is this, beloved, we must humble ourselves just as Christ did. We must love him and love one another as he has loved us and has given himself for us. 
Bible says, let this mind be in you, which was in Christ Jesus. He made himself here in our sight of no reputation and took the form of a bondservant. So in the Lord Jesus Christ, and in his example here in John chapter 13, we, we see true greatness exemplified. We see humble love, first point on your notes, we see humble love demonstrated. Look at verse 4. The Lord rose from supper, laid aside his garments, took a towel, and he girded himself. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel with which he was girded. We're reminded, right? One so high, stooping so low. As you meditate on that truth, you can see the reality of it. The Lord Jesus Christ stooping to take the form of a bondservant and wash the disciples' feet. The greatest love demonstrated and displayed in the greatest condescension. There can be no greater love than in the condescension of the Lord Jesus Christ to come into the world and die for sinners. And living here out, living out what he taught in Matthew chapter 5, verse 44, the Lord even loves his enemies when he washes the feet of Judas, who was reclining at the table with them prior to going out and betraying the Lord. So we see humble love demonstrated in the Lord. Second point on your notes, we see humble love demanded, verses 6 through 11. Revealing the spiritual reality expressed in his actions, the Lord tells Peter, you must let me cleanse you or you can't be saved. All right, look at verse 6. He came to Simon Peter. And Peter said to him, Lord, are you washing my feet? And Jesus answered and said to him in verse 7, what I am doing you do not understand now, but you will know after this. Peter said to him in verse 8, you shall never wash my feet. Right, into the ages, Peter said. And Jesus answered him, if I do not wash you, you have no part. You have no inheritance with me. In other words, if you want Christ, you must be washed by Christ. You must first acknowledge that you are filthy and in great need of cleansing. You have been dirtied, sullied, corrupted by your sin. You need to be cleansed by Christ. You must turn to him in repentance and trust him alone for salvation. But Peter got the point. And all his objections melt away, and he replies in verse 9, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. Anyone who is a genuine Christian can sympathize with Peter's words there. Just want Christ. I want Christ. Jesus said to him in verse 10, He who is bathed needs only to wash his feet, but is completely clean. And you are clean, Peter, but not all of you. In other words, you're already clean, Peter through the washing of regeneration. You're already forgiven, Peter, forgiven by God's grace through faith, and you stand justified in God's sight. You don't need that cleansing more than once. You are completely clean, having been cleansed and washed in the blood of the Lamb. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 12 says that this man, the Lord Jesus Christ, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, he sat down at the right hand of God from that time waiting till his enemies are made his footstool. For by one offering, he has perfected forever those who are being sanctified. And God's people can say to that, amen. However, as we walk in this world, we get our feet dirty, don't we? We all know that. 1 John 1.8 says if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. So on a day-to-day -day basis, we don't need the full cleansing of justification. That's already been done. We are washed whiter than snow. You will never be cleaner than you are in Christ positionally right now. But we step out of the bath, as it were, into this world. We get our feet dirty. We need the regular foot washing of sanctification, right? It involves daily confession, daily repentance from sin. That's what a true Christian must do. Confess their sin, turn from their sin, walk by faith in Christ. We must turn to the only mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, our great high priest who lives to make intercession for us. 
and who is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So we've seen humble love demonstrated by the Lord. We've seen humble love demanded. As we come to verse 12 this morning, we then see, point three on your notes, humble love directed. Humble love directed. Look with me at verse 12. So when he had washed their feet, taken his garments, and sat down again, he said to them, Do you know what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you say, Well, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. Most assuredly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is he who is sent greater than he who sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. So now, we've come to the conclusion of the lesson, right? The Lord sits down at the table, having concluded the lesson. In verse 12, the Lord takes his garments and goes back to his seat at the table. Now, one pastor noted that he couldn't imagine he couldn't imagine the Lord here, after having given the example of humble, serving love, then that the Lord, after having taken that towel off, put his garments back on, threw the dirty towel into the corner for somebody else to come along and pick up. Right? You just can't imagine the Lord doing that. In his heart and mind, he was thinking that the Lord neatly folded the towel and put it back, put it back in its place and then dressed himself again and went back to the table. Now, this is a lesson for us men. <laughs> guys don't throw we can't throw our dirty socks your dirty underwear into a corner and expect for your wife to come along and pick those up for you right don't leave a mess in the sink <laughs> this should be an exhortation to the men in the room love your wife and clean up after yourself okay now once the lord is back at the table sitting there with the disciples he begins to teach them and us the main point of the lesson, the main point of the lesson. And he begins with a question. He asks them in verse 12, do you know what I have done to you? As we're working through the text, first thing we need to do is we need to answer that question. Do you know what I have done to you? Well, the first thing that he's done is he's taught us a theological lesson. He's taught us a theological lesson. In verse 8, Peter said to him, you shall never wash my feet. And Jesus answers him then, moving from the picture to the reality, moving from the symbol to its significance. If I do not wash you, Peter, you have no part with me. You get the idea, right? It's a theological lesson. Then he taught us that we must continuously confess our sin and repent of sin as we walk through this world. So looking now at the Lord's example, he informs our understanding here, if you will, from the lesser to the greater, from washing the feet of the disciples to his far greater work of atoning for sin at the cross and cleansing in his own blood, cleansing them in the blood of the Lamb. Now in doing so, he directs our sight also. He directs our sight from this single, humble, loving act of service, a small drop in a stream, if you will, to the fountainhead, the source from which all of our single drops should find their motivation and meaning. He teaches us a theological lesson, a spiritual lesson from the act that he performs of washing the disciples' feet. Secondly, he's given us an example. Two things that he's done for us here in this lesson. One, he has taught us a theological lesson that we've already gone through. Secondly, he has given us an example. Look at verse 15. The Lord says, I have given you an example. An example of what? He's given us an example of what biblical, Christ-like love looks like. Now, let's consider that example together, okay? What can we glean from the Lord's example here that can teach us how to love as Christ loves? Having loved his own who are in the world, he loved them to the end. What did that love entail? I want to give you a list. If you want to write these down, this would be something worthy to meditate on. How did he love? What example of biblical Christ-like love did he give us? First, Christ-like love is a priority. 
Christ-like love is a priority. The Lord is facing death, right? The hour of his suffering is upon him, and yet the Lord graciously remembers those who are in the world. He is facing pain. He will bear the wrath of God against sin, and yet at that point in time, he concerns himself with the disciples. Love compelled him. Love impelled him. In the face of terrible circumstances, love motivated him to wash their feet and to provide this example for them. His circumstances that he's facing are in the Father's hands, and so the Lord can look to the needs of others. Christ-like love is a priority. Secondly, Christ-like love is independent. Independent. It's not dependent upon anything lovely in its object. He didn't love the disciples based on their worthiness to be loved. The disciples had just been arguing over who was the greatest. No one, not one, considered washing his feet. At his trial, at his crucifixion, they'd all fled. When they should have been by his side. When they should have been defending him. Judas betrayed him. So we consider these men, they are dramatically undeserving just as we are and yet knowing what they were knowing them the Lord took off his garments girded himself with the towel knelt at their feet and washed their feet even the feet of the betrayer Spurgeon said listen he gently handled that heel which had been lifted up against him washing from it the dust gathered in its secret walk upon the traitor's errand. Christ-like love is a priority. Christ-like love is independent. Christ-like love bears with all our failures. Consider this, Christian. The fact that it is unconditional proves that the Lord's love for his own will bear with your weakness. It will bear with your failures. It will bear with your time and time again repeated cries for mercy, cries for forgiveness, right? Confession of sin. He loved his own who were in the world. He loved them to the end. And that love, both unconditional, both independent, will bear with your struggles against sin, your striving against sin. It will bear with you. Christ-like love bears with all our failures. Fourth, Christ-like love involves humility and none so much as his humility. He was willing to perform the most menial task for their good. God had committed all things into his hands. He was enthroned in praise before the worlds began and he was soon returning there to inhabit that praise once again for all eternity. And yet he sto stooped to do the work of a slave. There's Spurgeon again. No wonder that Peter raised an objection suggested by reverential awe. Who could, without protest, receive such humble service from such hands? Yet our Lord did with heaven's supernal glory descending on him. He disrobed himself, though angels longed to cast the imperial purple about his shoulders. With all things in his hands, he yet took a towel and wiped the disciples' feet. Beloved, if our, loves, if our Lord's love bore these three strains, we may, like the apostle, be persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Christ-like love involves humility. Fifth, Christ-like love is perfect in degree. Is perfect in degree. He loved them to the end. Washing their feet is one example of the love that he has for his own that extends even to the cross. Greater love has no one than this, but that he lay down his life for his friends. It is a love then, if you consider that, it is a love that will certainly bear with you through any trial, through any difficulty, through any adversity. Sixth, Christ-like love is comprehensive in its scope. Comprehensive in its scope. 
He considers our needs, and he is attentive to every one of them. He is aware and attentive and cares for everyone, even in the minor things, even in washing the feet of the disciples. Matthew chapter 6, beginning in verse 31, says, Therefore, therefore, beloved, do not worry, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For after all these things the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. Listen, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow. For tomorrow will worry about its own things. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. Take your cares, take your concerns to Christ in prayer. Cast your cares upon him, for he cares for you. Seventh, in all of this, Christ-like love is selfless. It is self-denying, sacrificial, not concerned with its own needs. It esteems others and seeks to care for them. Christ could have, if you consider it that night in the room, right? Christ could have asked the disciples, commanded the disciples to wash one another's feet. And they would have done it gladly. However, he takes the task upon himself. And he removes his garments and wraps the towel around his waist. It is selfless. It is self-denying. Eight, Christ-like love is a delight to his people. It's a delight to his people. Lord, Peter says, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. You can hear the exuberance in Peter's response. It's a joy. It's a comfort to his own that he loves them in this way. Loves them enough not only to wash their feet, the physical dirt from their feet, but to wash the sin and the corruption and the guilt from themselves at the cross. Ninth, Christ-like love is concerned with the soul. Concerned that the disciples have been made clean. Concerned that they maintain clear accounts, a clean conscience. He's concerned about the purity of his people, the holiness of his people. Christ-like love is concerned for their repentance, concerned for their confession, concerned for their forgiveness, concerned for their soul's well-being, concerned that as they walk through this world, they have clean feet. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 25, Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word so that he might present her to himself a glorious church not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing but that she should be holy and without blemish and he instructs husbands after that that's how they're to love their wives christ-like love is concerned with the soul tenth christ-like love is from the heart it's from the heart the lord might have ended with a ritualistic foot washing. Right? Consider that for a moment. He doesn't do that. In verse 15, he says, do what I have done to you. Is that what he says? No. He says, do as I have done to you. The Lord might have ended this with ritualism, ending with the mere washing of feet, but he clearly points to and engages the heart. Do as I have done to you. Christ-like love is from the heart it's not mere, empty, heartless, godless ritualism. Eleventh, Christ-like love is trustworthy. It's trustworthy. It's worthy of our dependence, worthy of our confidence. Peter didn't understand it first, but the Lord said he would understand later. He asks Peter to submit to this in faith. Submit to it in faith because it is trustworthy. It's a love that cultivates within us a sense of security. Amen? Amen? How often can you go to him to get your feet washed? Seven times? <laughs> no, there's not a number for that. Go and get your feet washed. If you're in Christ, you are secure in Christ. If you're in Christ, you're sure in Christ. Confess your sin. Go to him for forgiveness. When Satan tempts me to despair and tells me of the guilt within, Upward I look and see him there who made an end to all my sin. Christ-like love is trustworthy. We need to embrace that love, right? Embrace that promise. Twelfth, Christ-like love cultivates our communion with him. 
13, Christ-like love is personal and it's kind. 14, Christ-like love is patient. Right? He bears with Peter's initial objections and Peter's many subsequent failures. 15th, Christ-like love is particular, particular and individual. He loves each disciple, and yet he loves his disciples. We know that he loves each member of his body, and he loves his body, the church. We could go on, right? One example after another. If you just did observations on this act of Christ-like love, one example after another, you have to conclude with this one, that Christ-like love is to be the model for all who are his own. When we consider what he has taught us, the Lord asks the question, right? What have I done to you? Do you know what I've done to you? Consider these things. The last being that Christ-like love then is the model for all who are his own. This love that Christ demonstrates is both to inform our understanding and to fuel our love for both him and for one another. Look with me at John chapter 13, at verse 13. He goes on with a lesson. He says there, you call me teacher and Lord, and you say well, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. So now we've considered the Lord's question in verse 12. Do you know what I have done to you? As we consider the question, it's staggering, isn't it, what the Lord has done. It's astonishing what the Lord has done. Especially now as we read and understand this in the searing light of the cross. It's mind-blowing, right? Think for a moment. Think. Meditate on these realities. You are a sinner, defiled by sin, guilty, destined, bound for hell, a citizen of hell, a son of your father the devil. And the Lord Jesus Christ condescends to redeem you to himself, to cause you by the Spirit of God to be born again, draws you to himself, grants you repentance and faith. It's mind-blowing, right? Humbling matchless. It's sublime that the Lord would save sinners like you and I. Undeserved, all of grace, perfect, comprehensive, precious, permanent. And what is also staggering is the fact that he is here about to ask us to love one another in the same way that he has loved us. Now, as Lord, he could have foregone the example, couldn't he? He could have foregone the humility of the foot washing and merely commanded his disciples to love one another. You can hear the disciples, right? Why? The Lord answered, because I said so. <laughs> Dads, how many times have you said that before? Why? Because I said so. But he doesn't do that. In infinite wisdom, he graciously roots and grounds his instruction in two things. One, who he is, and two, what he has done. He grounds his instruction, founds his command in two objective truths, who he is and what he has done. In that, he has done good. He has been gracious and merciful to us. We'll see that in a moment. Our Lord and teacher has loved us in this way so that we can follow his commands, not merely as duty, right, just do what I say. But we can follow his commands in delight. We can delight in him, and we can delight in what he has done, and then we can delight in living that out in our Christian lives, right? Loving him, worshiping him, and loving one another. Not just a duty, but our delight. And that's a delight from the heart for his glory, for his name's sake. Now consider first, one, who he is, two, what he's done. Consider first who he is. He is our Lord and our teacher. That's how we relate to him. He is our Lord and teacher here in verse 13. The word for Lord in verse 13 is the word kurios. Now kurios is sometimes translated sir 
or master. But on the lips of the Lord Jesus Christ, it carries more weight than that, doesn't it? Right? Something more profound is being said here. Our understanding of kurios culminates with Thomas's confession in chapter 20, verse 28, where Thomas says, my Lord and my God. That's right. More to this word here than just sir or master. We know what teacher is. That's the word didaskalos in Greek, teacher. So now in verse 13, Jesus is building an argument. And the argument is meant to undergird or support their response to his example. Jesus says, you call me teacher and Lord, and you say, well, for so I am. Now, if he is teacher and Lord, then who are we in relationship to him? The word that corresponds with didaskalos, teacher, is the word disciple, mathetes, disciple. A learning follower. A disciple is an apprentice. A disciple is someone who will follow the Lord Jesus Christ and do just as he does. A learning follower, a learning obeyer, an apprentice, someone who will follow and do. The word that corresponds to kurios, Lord, is doulos, which is slave. Someone who follows Jesus as Lord, obeys him as Lord in all of his commands as slave. Didaskalos, mathetes, kurios, and doulos. If he is teacher and Lord, let it sink in, then you are disciple and slave. And that's who he is. That's who he is. Next, let's consider what he has done then. In this simple and beautiful and humble act of love, washing the disciples' feet, the kurios humbles himself and serves as a doulos. Do you see? The Lord takes the form of a slave. And now, relating to us in this way, the kurios then, the Lord, commands all of his douloi, all of his slaves, to do just as he has done. It's an argument from the greater now to the lesser, isn't it? From the greater, the Lord Jesus Christ, teacher and Lord, saying, if I can stoop, then you can stoop, right? Look at verse, verse 14. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. Now, our Lord, the one who died, calls us to die and to serve one another, to love one another. Men, you may be called upon to die protecting your wife, right? The Lord has called us to that. Consider Ephesians chapter 5, verse 25. Listen, husbands, love your wives. How? How? Just as Christ also loved the church and what? And gave himself for her. You love your wives just as Christ loved the church. That's what he's calling for here. For the purpose that, verse 26, he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word, that he might present her to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. So husbands, in the same way, husbands ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. Now think about it for a moment. What is to motivate that obedience? What's to motivate that love? What motivates the love of a husband for his wife in that way? What's to motivate the love of God's people for their brothers and sisters in that way? It's his love for us. His love for us, his example to us compels us. His example to us motivates our love for one another. Consider this in Romans chapter 5, verse 7. The Bible says, For scarcely, scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet perhaps for a good man someone would even dare to die. But listen, God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. Consider the example of our Lord, right? Who, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. 
Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. I've been crucified with Christ. I have died. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me, and the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and died. Right? Died and gave, his, gave himself for me. This reality, back in John chapter 13, this reality is expressed in verse 15. In verse 15. He is our teacher. We are his disciples. He, are, he is our Lord. We are his loving and rejoicing slaves. Now that's who he is. That's who he is. Consider for a moment what he has done. We are to follow his example and do and love others just as he has loved us. Look at verse 15. For, Jesus says, I have given you an example so that you should do as I have done to you. Not what I have done to you. This is not a prescription for foot washing ordinance in the church. It's as I have done to you, that you should love one another and love others as I have loved you. Now, from the teaching in the New Testament, we also understand, we come to understand, as, as the Lord establishes this love in his body, this love amongst brothers and sisters, love for his own, and in them loving one another, this becomes a mark of the community, a mark of the church. It becomes a genuine distinguishing mark that someone is truly and genuinely a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ. If you're in John chapter 13, drop down to verse 31. Look at verse 31. This becomes a mark of whether or not you are truly one of his disciples. You think to yourself, you know what? I'm not sure if I'm saved or not. You know, I, I, I set out to follow Christ. Maybe things aren't going well. I'm not sure that I'm a Christian. Maybe you think you're a Christian. Maybe you're sure that you're a Christian and you need to come face to face with the Lord's commands here to consider your true state before God and be honest with him about this. This becomes, this love, this example followed by God's people becomes a distinguishing mark that someone is truly a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ. Look at verse 31. So when he had gone out, Jesus said, now the Son of Man is glorified and God is glorified in him. If God is glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself and glorify him immediately. Little children, I shall be with you a little while longer. You're going to seek me, and I, as I said to the Jews, where I'm going, you cannot come. So now I say to you, verse 34, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. As I have loved you, that you also love one another. Now, the commandment to love one another is not new. Right, that was a summary of one part of the law, would be to love your neighbor as yourself, right? What's new, what's new is that this commandment to love one another is now rooted and grounded in the example of the Lord Jesus Christ himself. It's founded in his own love for his own. Having loved his own who are in the world, he loved them to the end, and we're to love one another in the same way that he loved us, right? It's rooted and grounded in his love to us, rooted and grounded in the example of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now look at verse 35. By this, all will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. This becomes a mark of the community. It becomes a mark of the Christian that you love one another. Let's look at John's teaching on this in other places. Go with me to 1 John. 1 John. Look at 1 John chapter 2. Let's look further at John's teaching on this very issue. This becomes a distinguishing mark that someone is truly a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ. If you do not have love for one another in this way, you are not his disciple. If you love one another in this way, all will know that you are my disciples. You see how that works. Okay? Look at 1 John chapter 2 and look beginning at verse 3. Now by this we know that we know him. You want to know that you're a Christian. You want to know that you're saved. You're on your way to heaven. You are in him. That you stand justified before God. And when you stand before God in judgment, he will see Christ's righteousness credited to you. He will not look at your filthy rags. He'll look at the righteousness of his son and welcome you into the family of God in heaven. 
right? By this we know that we know him if what? If we keep his commandments. He who says, I know him, I'm a Christian, and does not keep his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word, truly the love of God is perfected in him. By this we know that we are in him. He who says he abides in him ought himself also to walk just as he walked. Do you see the example there? A Christian, someone who says that they are in Christ, is to walk as Christ walked. We're to live according to his example. Look at verse 6. He who says he abides in him ought himself also to walk just as he walked. Brethren, verse 7, I write no new commandment to you, but an old commandment which you've had from the beginning. The old commandment is the word which you heard from the beginning. Again, a new commandment I write to you. Now, that sounds a little confusing, but the Lord is saying essentially here what he is saying in John chapter 13. Right? This commandment now is not an a new commandment it's an old commandment in the sense that you've all always had this commandment but now in Christ it is rooted and grounded in the example of the Lord Jesus Christ all right verse 8 again a new commandment I write to you which thing is true in him and in you because the darkness is passing away and the true light is already shining he who says he is in the light and hates his brother is in darkness until now Let's just make that really clear. How do you hate your brother? Well, you don't love him. You don't love him. The Lord Jesus Christ has given us an example of what love looks like. It's the example of his own love for his own. If you don't love your brother, love your sister, as the way the Bible describes, the way that the Bible commands, you don't love your brother, you hate your brother. Okay? Now consider these things. Verse 10, He who loves his brother abides in the light, and there's no cause for stumbling in him. He who hates his brother is in darkness and walks in darkness and does not know where he is going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. Now, how do we love our brother? We love our brother as Christ has loved us, as he humbled himself and he gave himself for us. We give ourselves to our brothers and our sisters in the way that Christ has loved us and given himself to us. Flip the page and look at 1 John chapter 3. 1 John chapter 3. John is building this argument through this little letter. Look down at verse 23. First John chapter 3, verse 23 says, And this is his commandment, that we should believe on the name of his Son, Jesus Christ, and love one another as he gave us commandment. Flip the page and look at 1 John chapter 4 and drop down to verse 19. 1 John chapter 4, verse 19. We love him, why? Because he first loved us. But he gives us such a great example of his love for us, and we love him. We love him for all that he's done for us, okay? We love him because he first loved us. Look at verse 20. If someone says, I love God, and he hates his brother, he's a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen, how can he love God whom he has not seen? And this commandment we have from him that he who loves God must love his brother also. Now, if you're thinking through this, a clear distinguishing mark of who is truly a Christian. Amen? Can't get any clearer. It's the clear distinguishing mark. How do we know? How do we know that we are loving our brothers in the way that the Lord Jesus Christ has loved us? Not all of us will be called upon to die for our brother. Or we're called upon to love our brothers and if necessary lay down our life for our friends how do we know that we're loving our brothers in the way that Christ has loved us look at first John chapter 5 and look at verse 2 verse 2 says it's by this we know that we love the children of God when we what we love God and demonstrate our love to him by keeping his commandments right by this we know that we love the children of God we love God and we keep his commandments verse 3 for this is the love of God what that we keep his commandments and his commandments are not burdensome now let's make that clear right crystal clear when the Bible says when the Bible says to consider one another to stir up love and good works what do you do 
you love God, you keep his commandments, what do you do? You consider one another and you stir up one another to love and good works. You obey that command of God. If you love God, you keep his commandments, you're showing yourself, 1 John chapter 5, verse 2, that you love the children of God. You consider one another and you stir up one another to love and good works. When the Bible says, when the Bible says to not forsake the assembling of yourselves together, what do you do? You assemble with your brothers. Do you see how easy this is? How clear? Right? What do you do? You assemble with your brothers. When the Bible says to exhort your brothers daily while it is called today, what do you do? You want to assure your hearts before him that you're in the Lord, that you're truly one of his disciples. You love God. You keep his commandments. What do you do when the Bible says to exhort your brothers daily while it is called today? What do you do? You exhort your brothers. You exhort your brothers. You exhort your brothers daily while it is called today. When the Bible commands you, when the Bible commands you to warn those who are unruly, when the Bible commands you to comfort the faint-hearted, we're familiar with this text, aren't we? When the Bible commands you to uphold the weak, to be patient with all, to see that no one renders the evil to, uh, for evil to anyone, to pursue what is good both for yourselves and for everyone, for all, what do you do? You obey that text. You obey that text. You see, these are the one another's in Scripture. These are all the one another's in Scripture. The Lord has given these, uh, these clear commandments to us. And listen, if they are commands to the Christian, to the Christian, those commands are not burdensome. They are our delight. We delight to obey those commandments because of all that Christ has done for us. Right? His perfect example compels us. His perfect love. Having loved me to the end, I desire from the heart to love him by loving my brothers, loving my sisters, by obeying his commandments. And it's my delight to do that. It's your delight to do that if you're in Christ. Are you obeying these? Are you obeying these? Are they your delight? Incidentally, with the Lord's help and by his grace, right? We want to, as a church, we want to provide opportunity for God's people to faithfully obey the Lord in these things. We thought and prayed and worked through scripture. Lord, we want to be faithful to you. We want your people to be faithful to you. Your faithfulness is our joy. <laughs> And our crown, we want to see you blameless and holy in his sight. So we thought to ourselves, we want to give opportunity for God's people to faithfully obey this. So where does obedience to these commands to love one another in this way find a platform or find opportunity in our church? How do we facilitate in our church obedience to these things? Small group. Now, there may be other ways to do this. We have determined for our church that we want to give this opportunity for God's people to obey God in these things and to love one another in these ways and obey the Lord's commands. And so you have opportunity for this in small group. Now, if you're not faithful to small group, then I wonder in our church, how you take opportunity to be faithful to these things apart from that. I wonder, are you? Are you obedient to these things? Are you loving your brothers in this way? From my experience, take it what it's worth. Most people, part of a church like this, who are not faithful in small group are not doing these things. There's limited opportunity on a Sunday morning to do these things. And most people who call themselves by the name of quote-unquote Christian aren't faithful to do these things apart from this platform that we've provided, this opportunity that we've provided. Brothers and sisters coming around you and helping you to obey the Lord in these things. That opportunity comes through in our church, small group. 
food for thought, and food for self-examination. Back in John chapter 13. As we work through this now, I want you to follow the Lord's argument with me. Follow the Lord's argument with me so far. The Lord says, basically, consider how I have loved you. Okay? Consider how I have loved you. He says, I am your Lord and your teacher, and I, as your Lord and teacher, have loved you in this way. Now, he says, go and love one another in the same way. Now, the Lord then, with this application, with this thought, he ends his teaching with a warning and with a reward. Right? With a warning and with a reward. A warning in verse 16 and a reward in verse 17. Let's take a look at the warning first in verse 16. The Lord says in verse 16, Most assuredly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is he who is sent greater than he who sent him. He starts most assuredly, truly, truly, verse 16. Basically what the Lord is saying in verse 16 is this. Consider the name by which you are called. You call yourself a Christian. Then consider whom it is that you are submitting to. Consider your position, the position that you claim to hold in Christ. Consider the name by which you identify yourself. You, the Lord says, are a disciple and a slave. The Lord says, I am teacher and Lord. Verse 16 is saying, listen, count the cost of following me. A servant is not greater than his master. A slave is not greater than his Lord. If I, your Lord, have loved in this way, and you claim to be mine, you claim to be a Christian, then you must love in a way that I've commanded you to love. You must love one another, and you love one another in this way. A slave is not greater than his Lord. Now then, verse 16, he adds another dimension to our relationship with him. We've seen teacher and disciple. We've seen Lord and slave. But then he says at the end of verse 16, nor is he who is sent greater than he who sent him. He's adding another, another dimension to this. He is the sender, and you and I, we're the sent ones. We're the sent ones. I want you to consider... As we work through the Gospel of John, from John chapter 13 to the end of the book, there, is, there are several themes that run throughout the book, and we're going to cover those as, we, those as we go. One great theme that's already been introduced to us in John chapter 13 is the theme of love. There's also the theme of evangelism, the theme of mission. We're going to see that developed more clearly as we work through the Gospel. Here, he is adding this dimension. You, I am the teacher, you are the student. I am the Lord, you are the slave, I am the sender, and you are the sent one. Flip the page to John chapter 15. John chapter 15. And I want you to get the feel for this in a couple of spots, again, right here in the Gospel of John. In John chapter 15, and look beginning with me at verse 9. Verse 9 says, As the Father loved me, I also have loved you, now abide in my love. It sounds like chapter 20, verse 21, where the Lord says, as the Father sent me, I also send you. As the Father loved me, verse 9, I also have loved you. Abide in my love, verse 10. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you that my joy may remain in you and that your joy may be full. This is my commandment, here it is again, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this than to lay down one's life for his friends. You are my friends. Boy, what a glorious thought, right? You are my friends if you do whatever I command you. That's interesting, isn't it? That friends there and commands go hand in hand. Look at verse 15. No longer do I call you servants, for a servant doesn't know what his master is doing. But I have called you friends for all things that I heard from my Father I have made known to you. We consider it as we work through this section of Scripture in John 13 that the Lord gives us motivation. He gives us his own example. He could have said, do it, and we would obey as his slaves. But he doesn't just say, do what I say, or because I said so. The Lord gives us glorious reasons why who he is, what he has done for us. He gives us his example, his perfect example, right? 
That is in the wisdom, the infinite wisdom of God and his, his grace and mercy to us that he deals with us in that way. Here he tells us, verse 15, if you were merely a slave, he could say jump and you'd say how high, okay? But that's not how he interacts with us. That's not how he relates to us. I don't call you servants any longer. A servant doesn't know the reasons why, doesn't have all that glorious motivation, doesn't get to see behind the curtain, so to speak, in the eternal counsels and decrees of God for us. A slave doesn't know what his master is doing. But I have called you friends, he says in verse 15, for all things that I heard from my father, all these glorious truths, all these glorious motivations, these reasons why I have made known to you. That is a grace of God to us. And it should compel, impel our love and devotion and worship of him, right? If that can't motivate you, you have a dead heart. This should motivate the Christian to go out and live for the Lord Jesus Christ fervently and faithfully. He says in verse 16, you did not choose me. Wow, it can't get any clearer than that. You did not choose me, but I chose you and what? Appointed you. Now, he appointed you to an end. He appointed you with a mission. He appointed you with a purpose that you should go and bear fruit. You should go and bear fruit. And that your fruit should remain. And whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give to you. These things I command you, that you love one another. Love one another, you, loving one another, you go out and bear fruit. Flip the page to John chapter 17. John chapter 17. Very clearly stated here. Look at verse 18. With this love, the love with which he loved us, we are to love one another, we are to go out with that love into the world. Verse 18. As you sent me into the world, I also have sent them into the world. This is part of the Lord's high priestly prayer to God. Listen, verse 19. And for their sakes I sanctify myself, that they also may be sanctified by the truth. I do not pray for these alone, but also for those who will believe in me through their word. Well, that's me and you. We believe through their word. That torch being passed down, the message, the gospel going out from generation to generation and down to us. And we, by the Lord's grace, by his gift of grace to us, through faith, turn from our sin, put our trust in Christ, and he's praying for us here. Look at verse 21. What is he praying for? That they all may be one, as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be one in us, that, right, so that the world may believe that you sent me. Now think about it. That is evangelism. That is mission. It's so that the world may believe that you sent me. Verse 22. And the glory which you gave me, I have given them, that they may be one just as we are one. I in them and you in me, that they may be made perfect in one. Here it is again. And that the world may know that you have sent me and have loved them as you have loved me, so that the Lord, the world will see the love that God has for us in saving our wretched souls and see the love that we have for one another and in that know that God has both sent the Lord Jesus Christ and the Lord Jesus Christ has loved us as God has loved the Son. Verse 24, Father, I desire that they also, whom you gave me, may be with me where I am, and that they may behold my glory which you have given me. For you loved me before the foundation of the world. O righteous Father, the world has not known you, but I have known you, and these have known that you sent me. And I have declared to them your name, and will declare it, that the love with which you loved me may, may be in them, and I in them. See, we are, we are sent. We are sent with a mission of love. As the Lord Jesus Christ has loved us, we then are sent by the Lord to love one another and so that the world may see that love. The, lo the world sees that love in the way that we live and love one another, but also in the proclamation of the gospel. You're sent with a mission of love. Now, follow the Lord's argument with me again. We're building this argument with the Lord through this text. 
The Lord Jesus Christ expresses a love for his own that is matchless. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. All right? The Lord displays, expresses his love for his own to the greatest possible extent. His own, then, are to emulate his example, are to live according to his example by loving one another. We love one another in accord with the example that he has set for us so that the world may know God's love through his own and believe that the Lord Jesus Christ was sent by God the Father to die for sins. You see it? Jesus expresses his love for his own. His own display that love by loving one another so that the world may know God's love through the people of God and believe that God sent Jesus to die for them. Back in John chapter 13. The Lord completes this lesson then with a blessing, with a reward. Verse 17 says, If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. You're not know, putting the text together, right? The Lord's beautiful, clear lesson. This beautiful, clear object lesson. He loves us immeasurably, infinitely, immutably, eternally, freely, electingly, independently, all the ways that he loves us, right? Consider how the Lord Jesus Christ has loved us, how he has loved us in the gospel, how this picture of the foot washing beautifully illustrates the reality of that love that he demonstrated for us at the cross. You think about that love, and then we're committed.